Hi, welcome along to Taking the Beers. This is a channel dedicated to A-level business students, helping them with their revision. If you're new to this channel, if you've only just stumbled across us, definitely think about subscribing. In this tutorial, we're gonna take a look at something known as organizational culture, and we're gonna have a spider theory around organizational culture developed by a chap called Charles Handy. Let's launch into it by explaining exactly what we mean by an organizational culture. It's a bit of an abstract concept. This can be a difficult one to understand. We should think of an organizational culture almost like the personality of a business and organizations have got their own ways of doing things each organization has its own style its own way that it tries to get things done we can really think of the organizational culture of a business as the way things get done in that business the way they do things now in organizations, there are, of course, going to be official cultures, formal cultures, those that are set, those that are determined by the, the people at the top of the organizational structure, the way they see the organization's personality, the ethos that they believe in, the style that they want the organization to adopt. But within that, there's also the potential for what are known as informal cultures as well. Just because the key decision makers in an organization slay down something as the culture that they want the organization to adopt, doesn't mean that there can't be pockets within that of employees that set their own informal cultures, their own ways of doing things, their own working practices. So in organizations, we can have formal cultures which are decreed for the organization to try and adopt but within that, we must be aware that we can also have informal cultures as well. So maybe an entire functional area adopts its own culture or just teams of workers within that might adopt their own culture. And these informal cultures can be incredibly powerful, incredibly strong. What workforce members decide to do themselves and arrange for themselves can be very, very powerful, sometimes more powerful than what the people at the top of the organization decree the rest of the organization should be doing. Now, our friend Charles Handy was very active in the 1960s and 1970s, going into organizations and observing them and having a look at the kind of cultures that they were adopting, the kind of ethoses that businesses were using, the kind of ways that businesses were getting work done, the way that they were doing things. And Handy observed four different classifications of culture that he saw were very prevalent and very active. And one of the key things that separates these four different types of culture is where power comes from. Who has power? Who is uh, kind of given freedom with within the organization to exercise power? And Handy thought that power was a very key determinant in distinguishing between the different kind of feels, ethoses, personalities, and cultures of an organization. So power was absolutely critical in determining the way things got done in different organizations. So if we take a look at the four different classifications Handy came up with, the first is what is known as a power culture. So these are organizations that really revolve around the personalities of a few key central decision makers in the organization. Everybody reports to, everybody gravitates towards, everybody looks towards a few key central decision makers for instruction, for guidance, for praise, for confirmation that they've done a good job. We have this core group at the center of the organization and they set the tone and the culture and the ethos for everything that's done. Everybody reports to them. Everybody sees them as the, the gravitational pull at the center of the organization. Now, to illustrate that, think of a popular TV show like The Apprentice. We've clearly got an organization on that show where a few key core influential individuals are setting the tone and the direction of the entire organization. And everybody on that show, not even just the contestants, are looking towards those central individuals for guidance, for instruction. They are looking towards those central individuals and they are so dominant, they are so strong, they are so powerful that they determine the outcomes and the working practices and the ethos and the personality 
of that entire organization. Now, that works very well if we have got people at the center of that organization that are highly respected, that are proven, that are competent, that are strong decision makers, that everybody respects and looks to and naturally wants to willingly gravitate towards. Where it breaks down is where people start to have their own issues and concerns about the abilities of those at the center of the organization. And that's when a power culture might find that different fragmented satellite cultures start to appear in the organization because of a breakdown in the trust and the belief and the abilities of those at the center. So a different way of doing things that Handy observed is what's known as a role culture. In this organizational culture, the role of the hierarchical structure of the business is absolutely critical. Rather than a power culture where power is the preserve of a few people at the center, in a role culture, power is dependent on your position in the organizational structure. And the higher up you've risen through the ranks of the organizational structure, the more power will be ceded to you in order to make decisions and have influence over the organization. These kind of cultures are very, very procedural. They're very, very bureaucratic. It's all about following the chains of communication in the organization, reporting to line managers, being in charge of subordinates, keeping your span of control very, very rigorous. But in a role organization, it's almost like the job description is more influential in determining who has power than the personality of the individual. So you might have people who've risen quite a high way up the organizational structure and they will be very influential and they will be powerful, even though in certain scenarios and certain situations, they might not have as good an insight or the skills or the experience to make a decision than somebody further down the organization. But with a role culture, that's not taken into account. The hierarchy is the dominant factor in setting the ethos and the working practices and the way things get done in that organization. Now, again, if you naturally have people who rise up the hierarchy, who are talented, who are skilled, who are strong decision makers, who are powerful leaders that people respect, role culture can work very well. Where the role culture breaks down is where you have people in positions of responsibility setting the tone and the culture of the organization, but perhaps they are not seen as being as effective as those that may be lowered down in the organization. And again, that can create tension. And again, we might have satellite informal cultures springing up where people try to combat or fight against the role culture that the organization is trying to instill. Different approach again is what's known as a task culture. And task cultures we can kind of think of as fitting in with what we know as a matrix structure in an organization. Remember a matrix structure is where people come out of the organizational structure of the organization to work on a particular project or a particular team. And Handy noticed that this brings in its own type of culture in organizations. When people move temporarily from the organizational structure and they move on to project teams where they're trying to solve a particular problem or whether they're active in trying to sort of bring to fruition a particular project or, or, or new initiative that the organization is investing in, these teams can take on their own task cultures, as he called it, where people's position in the hierarchy no longer is as important in determining how powerful they are. When people move over onto these tasks, these project teams, suddenly what they've got to contribute to that task, their knowledge, their skills, their experiences, what they have to offer, suddenly becomes a greater source of power than maybe was allowed when they were working in the strict bureaucracy of an organizational structure. So task cultures can be very, very effective at getting the best out of a team, because rather than only being able to use power if you've reached a certain level in the hierarchy, now you can exercise power if you've got something important to offer. So you can let your skills and your qualities be what decides whether you have power rather than just the role that you are fulfilling in the organization. Final type of culture identified by Handy, he referred to as a person culture, is not a very commonly used type of culture, certainly not in terms of being the formal official culture that the organization is trying to instill. And in a person culture, the 
individuals acting in that organization have become more important than the organization as a whole. They are operating outside of the restrictions of any formal hierarchy. They are autonomous, they are empowered, they are off making decisions that they see Bit. Sometimes it could even lead to them making decisions that are in their own interest rather than the organisations. Certainly it can lead to them making decisions that are only in the short term interests of the organisation rather than being in the longer term goals of the organisation. Where we do see person cultures could be in professions, maybe uh, teams of lawyers, accountants, architects, where we have highly skilled, highly trained, very, very dominant individuals who rather than fitting in with the, any other of the organizational styles, are literally just autonomous beings off doing their own thing, making their own decisions. Now that can work well in areas like the law where you might have very highly skilled, very highly trained lawyers each operating in their own area of specialism. So you might have criminal lawyers, you might have family lawyers, you might have contract lawyers, and they're off doing their own thing, operating on their own, operating autonomously, independently, and it's literally like they have become more important in their position than the organization as a whole. So there's our four different types of structures, four very different type of organizational cultures that we might see. Key things to remember, number one, we have got, absolutely, we have got formal organizational cultures that those that run the organization try to set and instill within the business that they're operating. But we should remember that we also have informal cultures that pockets of workers or entire branches or departments might develop independently themselves. We should also remember that Handy didn't say that any of these cultures were particularly favorable or better than the others. Each has its own issues and its own benefits that organizations need to be aware of. So hopefully that covers you for organizational culture. Keep on taking the beers. Good luck with the rest of your revision. We'll see you soon.